see, Dathan in Alberta, Canada. Yep. Hello. Hello. Hi. I just had a quick question for you guys. I was wondering uh, what at first glance was the most convincing argument for the existence or something supernatural and something that you couldn't refute at first glance and you had to look into it properly and what made that hard to refute? I, I don't... At first. I haven't found any supernatural claims to be convincing, so... It is often difficult when somebody calls in with a complicated personal experience and says, you can't explain that. Like, I dreamed about my mother dying and then she died the next day or something like that. But mm -hmm. almost all the time, I when you dig deeper into those kinds of claims, you find that the story sort of falls apart as you dive into it further. And it turns out to be something much less surprising or shocking than the person originally was yeah. saying. Or there are some mitigating details like, by the way, my mother had been sick and the doctor said she had two weeks yeah. to live. <laughs> uh, you yeah. can't always just call yeah. people liars when they tell you that something happened to them. Because unlikely events really do happen. But... It, we don't mm -hmm. have to have an explanation for everything off the top of our heads. All right, yeah, I, I kind of had problems answering the question myself because I really haven't heard an original argument other than argument from personal experience, but I just wanted to get yeah. your guys' opinion on that. That's it, I, I guess, on the shortest color of this show. <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. Have a good day. All right, yep. thanks. I also think that most arguments that don't fall in the category of personal experience tend to be these sort of arguments in a vacuum where there's some kind of pure math proof of God that yeah. just doesn't bother with evidence or investigation or experiments and just says, oh, God is the set of things that contains all things or yeah. something. <laughs> I'm talking to you, Chris Lang. And yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Let's see, where are we? Rory in New Zealand? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Um, so I was just calling, like, uh, obviously, I mean, the whole world has been watching the U.S. elections. Um, I was just wondering um, what your point of view is with um, uh, the separation of church and state. I mean, I know that's what, I mean, particularly in America, the Founding Fathers, Obviously, that was their goal, but do you think it's really happened? Uh, if you're asking where we stand, I think the fact that I say for the separation of church and state, yeah, it should, it should be, be a big clue at the beginning of every single show. Uh, do oh, yeah, do no, I think I, it's I happened? That, yeah, Obviously no. not. Yeah. Um, so, so like, what what do you think? Like, uh, what what could be done to? actually help like I mean because I mean it, it seems like none of the candidates nobody and I mean yeah no, nobody really wants to change anything well I mean one of the things that would help a lot in this country is if um, we actually started enforcing the IRS rules on churches participating in or you know like um, actually um, promoting a particular candidate or a political party um, that sort of um, involvement in partisan politics is specifically prohibited by um, IRS rules. Specifically, the 501c3 rule, which churches are 501c3 religious organizations, just like the ACA is a 501c3 educational organization. Um, the difference is that once you declare yourself to be a church, you no longer have to follow some of the same rules that other nonprofits have to follow. Um, so I think um, right. two things. If we actually enforced that provision and basically removed their tax-exempt status if they violate the rule, uh, that would help. The other thing is if we, um, if we force churches to follow the same rules as every other 501c3 organization, I think that would help a lot too. Right. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, no so I was just calling about that. Like, uh, yeah, because we've been watching it. And you know, I live in New Zealand, and we're quite fortunate that if you ask any politician over here, who, you know, what they believe in, they'll change the subject. They won't talk about it at all. Well, and the and, thing is, I, I, yeah, I think that, 
um, if, if somebody asks a politician what they believe, I have no problems with the politician answering that question, you know, whatever the answer is. Um, the big question for me uh, when I take a look at a politician is, will this politician use their religious beliefs as a basis for public policy? And if the answer is yes, then we have a problem. Yeah, a uh, little bit of historical context here. When John F. Kennedy ran for president in 1960, I hope I've got that history right. Yep, I think that's right. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, John Kennedy ran against, uh, ran for president in 1960, and he was the first Catholic president in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the one of the big things that the Nixon camp ran against him was, we can't trust a Catholic in office because he's going to be beholden to the Pope and right. he's not going to be uh, supportive of American religious liberty ideals. Right. And Kennedy gave a speech which I think is worth looking up on YouTube because it is a textbook answer of a great way to answer that question which is basically, yeah, I'm Catholic and I believe it seriously and I understand that US law trumps anything that my religious beliefs might tell me, and I will faith faithfully uphold and execute the law. And that's really all the principle of church and state separation is about. It's not about saying no politician should have any po personal religious beliefs or talk about them in any context. And we as atheists generally don't or shouldn't care what the personal beliefs are, a lot of people went after Mitt Romney by listing the tenets of Mormonism. Right. And I'm like, there are so many good reasons not to like Mitt Romney. Who cares if his set of wacky beliefs is different from the wacky beliefs right. of most other politicians? Hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, well, I suppose that's, uh, that's really all I was calling for, so... Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah, wish us uh, luck. Just, However, just you on, think the election yeah. should turn out, we don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just on a side note, I think what you guys are doing is just brilliant, and I think thank we need you. more people like you in the world. Well, thank you. Yeah. Cheers. All right. Bye. All right. Okay. All right. Let's see. Hard to jumped around line so much I'm just trying to take the one who's been on the line the longest no actually I'm gonna take Vish in London hello Vish are you there hello yes I'm here hey hello yeah, I'm here. <laughs> oh sorry I had the mute button pressed down I'm, I'm, apologies that's okay <laughs> I am um, it happens uh, pretty psyched about being on your show um, <laughs> yeah it does um, I actually had a um, real question, well, real, um, like, ultimate real, like the other guy was trying to say, like, in the last show, but <laughs> um, I had um, a question about, basically, um, when can you be too, okay, before I go on, I'll just give you a really quick context, because I know people give you stories about themselves, like, all the time, but, um, so, basically, I used to be about, like, I used to be a Christian for about a year, and then I, you know, um, started using my brain, well, that'd be a bit harsh to say, um, I started, um, you know, being a bit more spec uh, skeptical towards um, these things. And in the beginning of the show, you were saying something about, like, you know, um, being, you know, like, why you were talking about the presidential stuff like that. Right. And, you know, you were right about the whole thing about, you know, being, a, you know, skeptical as part of the whole atheist thing. And, um, you know, because of being, you know, skeptical about things, you know, I stopped being a Christian and... Um, and, yeah, so I actually um, wanted to ask, uh, you know, like, for example, um, you know, with me, um, you know, I, I, I find it trouble to believing things and, you know, in believing things. And I know, like, you know, for example, uh, I, this isn't about controversial, uh, no, sorry, um, conspiracy theories, like, but the thing is, I'm just going to bring up an example. For example, the first moon landing, okay, um, like, personally, like, I don't have, evidence, you know, which suggests that, you know, um, that the first moon landing actually happened, like, you know, the, uh, the mission back then. I mean, like, I know this sounds ridiculous, you guys, and <laughs> apologies for that, but, um, like, it's kind of the case that, I mean, there's videos and things like that, but, you know, I don't know whether things have, you know, whether things can be edited, and you know what, it's not even just about that, it's also about um, 
Jen, you were your biolog- biologist or a biochemist or something? No, I'm an um, aerospace engineer. Aerospace engineer. Um, and the moon landings happened, was. by the way. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure they did. I'm sure they did. But um, it's kind of the case that, like, I, I mean, no, obviously I know that people have been to the moon now and stuff like that, but it's kind of the case, like, why do I know? And, you know, it's kind of like, am mm-hmm. I being too skeptical about these things? Like, um, you know, for example, if I, if, you know, when it comes to evolution, um, if I saw, like, you know, a whole, like, bunch of fossils, because the thing is that I don't believe in it at the moment. Like, I know it sounds ridiculous, but at the moment I don't until I actually go to, the, like, I planned a trip to the Natural History Museum um, next week to actually, because I want to believe it and I want to, like, you know, start believing in things and, you know, it's kind of the case that um, I don't know if that evidence might be enough. I don't know, like, in that case, like, there'll be fossils, but will I believe that? Like, it's until I actually go and, like, people will believe it after seeing it, but I'd question if it's um, real or not until I actually made the discovery myself in a way. I think, I, mean, a, I think a lot of people maybe misuse the word skeptical mm-hmm. to mean... I have chosen a position and I refuse to budge from that position regardless of what you throw at me. And I think that Christians accuse atheists of having this actual point of view. And basically a lot of those arguments boil down to people saying, well, you atheists wouldn't believe in God even if God rang the doorbell and said, hi, I'm God, and predicted a bunch of things. (laughs) But, But it is possible to be someone who calls yourself a skeptic and believe things that fly in the face of established facts at the same time. And I I think it's a little weird to, I'm not sure if this is really what you meant that you're doing, but it, it's a little weird to be saying, I want to be convinced by seeing the fossils so I'm going to go look at the fossils, and until I've seen them with my own eyes, I will not believe in evolution. But I think they're there, and they'll convince me. Yeah. Which, I mean, going to, to the Natural History Museum to, you know, increase your knowledge um, is not a bad thing at all. Um, mm-hmm. In fact, I, I think it's great that you're going to do this. The thing is, if I understand what you're saying um, correctly... Um, and, and please correct yeah. me if I'm wrong. Um, what I hear okay. you saying is that you're struggling with um, how do you determine um, basically the quality of evidence that you're willing to accept when you didn't do the experiment or the thing yourself? And um, Kind of, yeah. I mean, it's, kind, it's not okay. even just the quality of the evidence because I'm sure there's people, like, you know, the people who found this stuff, you know, if they have, then it's like, you know, they, obviously, they've got far more insight on the field, and you know, I try avoiding these things at times because you know, I I want to contribute with what I'm good at, and so I try restricting myself a little bit to kind of you know excel at you know yeah, but uh, yeah. Stuff that avoiding I, you know, I do. avoiding weighing in on a topic that you don't understand doesn't excuse you from becoming more familiar with the available research yeah. on the topic. Yeah, I think. Mm. You can be skeptical of evolution, for example, if you just read creationist sites and you and you avoid gaining any deeper knowledge. But I think whether you're an atheist or a theist or a believer in a particular thing or a skeptic about that thing, it's a good idea to actually read the best stuff that the other side has to offer. And Mm. Also, be highly aware of straw man versions of that. Like, yeah. I really enjoyed. I really enjoyed the show Bullshit a lot of the time when it was on by Penn and Teller. But one of the yeah, things maybe. that annoyed me most is that it was very obvious that they were cherry picking the most soft targets to represent the other yeah. side of what they were trying to say, and that seemed a little bit lazy. And similarly, I would say that it's smart to actually look around and see what do people who advocate for evolution say is the best layman's book to start on to read it. And if you haven't at least given that a shot and read what they've got to offer, 
then yeah, you shouldn't weigh in on it because you don't yeah. know what you're talking about. Well, yeah, uh, exactly. And so, uh, as an example of something Russell was talking about, where basically look at the best the other side has to offer, and and then look at what. So, for example, the evolution side says, if you go to the website yeah. talkorigins.org. Talk origins dot on talk origins dot org. Yeah. Yeah, and if you go there, they've got um, the basically the creationist claims okay and they go mm. through each one of these claims and they actually link to the actual sites where creationists are promoting these specific arguments so they're basically yeah. linking to the opposition's arguments so that's the sign of somebody okay. that's telling you straight up this is this is the deal here's mm -hmm. exactly what mm. they're saying and this is why it's wrong and then they present okay you know links to to things that you can check out. Some of these are like primary sources, like peer-reviewed papers or, you know, things that have been reported, um, you know, and written up, books, things like that. Like so the primary sources where you can go and read about the evidence yourself. And so part of what your, your challenge as a skeptic is, is to properly vet your sources so that when you accept the claim of somebody that says, you know, this is the truth, this is what happened, uh, you're not being misled because this person who's promoting this claim is either not qualified to make that that assertion or they are trying to mislead you for some other reason. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's actually really helpful. I also had um, one one more thing. I, well, I'm sure it's going to be really small. Okay, um, we are about out of time, so uh, make it quick. Yeah, it's really quick. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask, like, okay, like, you know how, you know, science is, you know, um, well, not you know how, but, you know, I'm asking if it is. Um, it's like they kind of, you know, check uh, for results through consistency a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, if something is, yeah, so um, if, you know, um, you know, there's a book, right, and, you know, it's uh, doing, pre you know, predictions, and it's, you know, constantly, um, you know, getting them right, and it's being really consistent and accurate with it, um, would that, uh, how would, mm. I think you maybe know, you, you need to like, formulate your question carefully and call back another week. Yeah. I mean, like, okay, so would that be accurate? And I mean, would that be something to actually look at either way or would it, well, you, you know? You should, you should look at something like that. But the other thing that's important, if, if somebody is, has written something up and they're making predictions and they appear to be accurate, um, the thing you want to investigate is, is the methodology they're using to arrive at that prediction. So, because that's very important. They should be able to describe the methodology and other people should be able to take that same methodology and apply it to a similar circumstance and come to the same conclusion. You know, right. and that, oh, okay. And if they can't, so then there's something asking, wrong. Yeah. It's about anyway. asking, like, you know, if, if a book just says shit, like, you know, yeah. oh, uh, seriously, sorry, sorry, um, we're at the book just this is the end of the show. <laughs> thank you for yeah, calling. Right, Talk to you some other Bye -bye. time. Thank you so much for answering my question. All right. Love you, sir. Take care. Bye. Bye. And uh, sometimes I do a lightning round at the end, but I don't know. I'm feeling a little hungry and <laughs> and worn out. So that, All right. which, which way do you want to go? All right. Let's, let's pull the plug then. All right. All right. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much, Jen. It's been thank great you. to have you here as yes. always. As always, yes. A lot and of fun. Uh, we'll have a new show next week after the election. Matt will be hosting and somebody else will be co hosting. So uh, see you guys. Vote. Uh, at Star of India and see you at the Atheist Building here on Tuesday night. Bye. Hey. This is Russell Glasser, host of The Atheist Experience. 
You know, the Atheist Experience is made possible by volunteers and the generous support of viewers like you. If the promotion of positive atheist culture and separation of church and state are values that you hold, please consider contributing by becoming an ACA member or visiting our product page at EvolveFish.com under the Partner tab. Thank you.